everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us today for the 2023 Process and Performance Management Priorities and Challenges webinar. My name is Kelly South and I'm a research manager here at APQC and I work in the PPM space. Today we'll be discussing the results from our most recent Priorities and Challenges survey to review what is important to PPM professionals for the year and what changes they think might be necessary in the PPM discipline. So before we get started, one more reminder, please feel free to use the Q&A feature to submit any questions that you have during the presentation. And if we can't get to them at the end of the presentation, then we'll be sure to address them in our follow-up. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Jeff Barney. He's the Director of Advisory Services here at APQC. Jeff has been with APQC since 2006. And in his current position, he implements business process management and performance improvement, knowledge management, custom benchmarking, quality management, and performance measurement initiatives for APQC's clients. Jeff coordinates research, education, and hands-on support with clients for process and performance management and improvement. And he also supports all of our process man management research as a subject matter expert. So Jeff, thank you so much for being here today. We're really looking forward to hearing from you and please take it away. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, welcome to everyone. Uh, very pleased to be with you today and that you had the opportunity to join us. Uh, we often will do these types of research surveys to really get a kind of a pulse check of where the state of the industry is or the discipline in this case, process management, performance management. And so we wanna present the results here today uh, before we dig in too far, I do want to introduce you also to uh, Maddie Lindquist. She has now become our principal research lead for process and performance management at APQC. So she will be picking up a, a long history of, of work that we've done to go out and work with organizations to find out what works, what doesn't work, what's different about the various approaches to fit context and allow you to hopefully uh, adopt and adapt what we uh, have out there to improve all of our outcomes. So uh, Maddie, do you wanna say a few words of hello to the group? Sure, thanks Jeff. I am super excited. I am not new to APQC or process, but I am new to this role. I'm excited to jump in, hear about the 2023 priorities today and just keep learning about all things process. So thanks Jeff. Super, thank you Maddie. Um, one more thing about Maddie is that, as she said, she's not new to this topic area. She's been directly supporting our process and performance management area for, what, at least five years or more. Um, so behind the scenes, she's been doing a tremendous amount of work. She's familiar with what we've done to date, and she's going to pick up the ball and run with it uh, with the rest of our team. So again, really looking forward to the future with Maddie. Today, we're going to really go into, and we've done this, in, as I said, in previous years, but talk about what are the top challenges that we see from the audience that we surveyed um, around, you know, at the, at the end of 2022. Where are their challenges, key priorities and focus areas as they go forward with process and performance management? Talk about some of the tips and resources that we have at our disposal through our APQC research and our hands-on work with organizations um, as to what works and what might help to move forward along those challenges. And then uh, what is kind of the evolution over time of process management and some key takeaways that we have also observed from the, the data and information collected through this research. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump in and the best place to start typically is kind of from the top down. So we focused on six key areas as we thought about process and performance management. And we've, again, looked at these in previous years and looked at now where are the priorities and, and, and the challenges, the opportunities for evolving, because um, what worked five years ago may not work today, and there may be new and emerging approaches that we continue to have to understand, uh, adopt, and adapt as we go forward. So when we look at the broad brush here, you'll see that um, of those surveyed, 91% came back and said, we still have a focus to really understand and move forward with business process management. Continuous improvement came in a, a short second there, followed by data and measurement, project management. Strategic planning and benchmarking are also, as you can see, more than 50% of the audience indicated that those are critically important to them. But as you can see, 91% on process management versus 54% on benchmarking. And that means we need to really continue to support this audience with relevant research and support 
like this webinar to help to at least start the conversation and then maybe direct people to where there's other content um, and, and collateral that APPC can um, provide to support your path forward. So um, with that being said, I would just want to put a few kind of data points behind this before we get deeper, because you're going to see a lot of numbers in today's presentation. Um, first, um, when we think about who responded to this survey, it was a very good, broad, diverse group there. Um, when it comes to size of organizations, whether uh, it was, you know, 100 million to 500 million or looking at 20 billion or greater, it followed a really normal distribution for what we would see amongst the APQC membership uh, audience. Um, so it wasn't confined to small organizations, large, but really represented a good dichotomy there. The same thing when you look at the types of industries, it was very well distributed. So it isn't highly biased by one type of industry like oil and gas or consumer packaged goods, for instance. It's got a really good balance there. So that's really powerful in the data itself. And, and there were, as I recall, um, well, I don't have the actual number in front of me. I apologize. Um, I believe we had 160 uh, participants that directly responded to the entire survey and that we've included in the results today. So with that as a backdrop, I'm going to jump into then as something that's a little bit more compelling about the data and, and um, we'll start with process management. So, and you saw the business process management on the previous slide, process management here. We typically talk about process management, that's the words we use, but BPM, if you're familiar with that and you're comfortable with that, it's really synonymous in when we use the term. So uh, don't think that we're differentiating between the two, but uh, process management applies to any type of organization, whether they consider themselves a business or a, a, a group, a commission, whatever. So uh, we kind of leave that, that word off. Um, so let's look at then within process management, what we learned from that audience, 91% said it's, it is a, a high critical focus area for them to continue the growth, evolution, maturity, and improvement in 2023 and beyond. And when we look within then, what within business process management they care about, where they feel their primary challenges are, you'll see that uh, defining and mapping end-to-end -end processes came out at the highest. 34% of those responded that that is a primary focus area for them followed by moving from function-based to process thinking, and then improving the maturity level, level of process management. So what do those mean? And then we'll talk about a few uh, hints and tips coming up on the next slide. But when we think about end-to-end -end processes, we're talking about workflows and collaboration to get real value-based results and outcomes that cross teams, functions, departments, structures within your org chart. It's not work that one person can go off and do by themselves or a small team that might be able to do it. There's still a kind of a cross-functional flow there where people have to collaborate, but we're talking about the larger, more significant types of workflow. You often hear about order to cash or record to report or procure to pay or source to procure. There's many of them out there. Idea to market or concept to commercialize product delivery. There's all kinds of different large workflows that are essential to any type of organization. Um, we typically find that some organizations will focus on four to six as the ones that they really need to manage and optimize over time based on their strategies and needs. Some may look at 10, 12, or 14. There are literally hundreds of end-to-end -end workflows inside of any organization, but often there's that critical few. So understanding and clearly defining those that they need to take action on and get better control of what we do today, what we can improve and how we can do it collectively to better. That's really what we think about in defining end to end process and the mapping of those understanding what are the pieces, how do they fit together, are there alternate flows, what's the data and information that supports that what are the roles and skills that we need in order to do it correctly, and how do we collectively collaborate to get it done. That process knowledge of an end-to-end -end process is so, so viable at, for improvement to drive, again, what's important to the organization. So when we talk about that, organizations are doing this. They attempt to do this, but many of them struggle with how to do it because there's so many stakeholders. And it's a very, very complex thing to define, document, manage, improve, control, sustain, evolve. You can put all the words you want on that. But when we think of the life cycle of that end-to-end -end work, uh, very complex, lots of moving parts, and it's also very impactful to how well we're performing. 
Now I'm going to kind of shift on to the function-based thinking real quick. Um, what's the difference between function-based and process thinking? Well, function-based, what do I do? What are the skills I need? How do I get it done from the kind of individual perspective? My function, how do I do um, uh, create an invoice? But behind all of that, there's the process thinking view that says, how do we actually do it collectively? What's the workflow? And how does it integrate? All those pieces I talked about with end-to-end -end processes a moment ago. So going beyond kind of what we do within this small function to how do we collectively get it done and connect it to that end-to-end -end value stream, that's the process thinking side. It's a nuance, but it's critically important for individuals, teams, and functions to have that view and make sure that if we're uh, applying new technologies or we're changing the training and, and or staffing model, that we also then understand how does that affect the process thinking that lets us get it done the way we intend to and identify what's kind of coming up here, which is the improvement, right? Um, whether it's improving our maturity so we deliver it with more maturity and better, or it's actually changing what we do. And, and that ties into some of the continuous improvement on the right side of the, the screen here. So uh, I'm just gonna keep kind of walking through these, not as meticulous as the first two because we don't have three hours today, but um, that continuous improvement culture, and we'll come back to this, but it's so important. How do we get people thinking about what can I change to make what we do, how we do it from a process perspective, from a, a, a product or an organizational performance perspective and make it better, make it simpler, easier, more sustainable, um, you know, there's lots of different characteristics that we may want to drive our improvement. It's really based on business need, customer expectation, um, our overall strategies of how we want to deliver our products and services to our customers, our stakeholders. So how do we build and engender that mindset and then use that to identify in a more systematic way, not individuals going off and saying, I'm going to fix this, I'm going to change that. But now let's do it and look at it to say, here are our opportunities and don't just jump into making a change without thinking about, is it the right change? And is it the right time for that change? So this systematic approach to identify, prioritize, select, and then collectively work towards those improvement opportunities. So we're all moving forward together rather than everybody kind of moving independently and hoping it fits together and sticks together. Often that creates clutter, confusion, um, and, and is not the way we wanna go. So back into the continuous improvement culture, it means we have to have that transparency, the collaborative approach, the visibility to make sure that we're working together um, rather than against each other. Everybody's well-intentioned, but that's where we're going on the continuous improvement um, systematic approach there, right? And, and then how does that then tie into what we can do individually and collectively to not just make a change, but now tweak, tune, and refine that within certain constraints to make sure that we're not just saying today's good enough, but let's make sure we're we're always taking advantage of what can be done faster, better, cheaper, without breaking the continuity of the organization and, and maybe impacting negatively the customer or some other aspect of our, our kind of ecosystem we operate within. You'll notice the end values around the slides here to say how many organizations respond to these particular elements. So uh, that just gives you a sense of size. Again, it's a very, very, broad and, and well-represented group of, a, of an audience there. So I've kind of led into in the, that previous slide some of the conversation, but tips and solutions. It's very important for us to prioritize and right-size the work we're doing around end-to-end -end process. We can't just go and say, we're gonna tackle every end-to-end -end process we identify, all right? Or we don't necessarily wanna go after something simple and easy and not really strategic in nature either. So we have to understand where are our biggest challenges, the gaps to accomplishing what we need to, or the market opportunities that we're trying to fulfill, whatever that might be, technology, technology, digital transformation, maybe that's a driver, and saying, how do those needs and priorities then align to the end-to-end -end processes, the knowledge that we actually capture and have about the current state of those processes, and what are the then improvement opportunities within them to now make a change, make a difference. Again, using those same concepts from the previous slide. So prioritizing and right-sizing, and don't just attack it because you can, don't just try to change it because you can, but make sure that we're doing it at the right level. And the other side of, of right-sizing here means, it doesn't mean that we say, let's go into our process management tools and create detailed current state process documentation. 
because that may not be what's necessary today. It isn't creating direct value for us to identify, prioritize, and make a change. It may be great to have that knowledge captured about the process at some point in the future, but don't overanalyze and over-document. Analyze to the point where you can make decisions and say, can we now align and, and select this and decide to make a change or not? And if not, save that, make sure it's usable later, but now move on to and focus on the more detailed process work within your end-to-ends or even lower level processes where it is actually towards achieving, fulfilling some business outcome, organizational outcome and need. That's the key there. Don't just do it because we can, let's do it where it makes sense and it's necessary to make the next step. Collaboration is so critical here. And we talked about that. We can't just decide to make change by ourselves, but let's talk to the other organizations um, or groups within our organization. Maybe there's a knowledge challenge around that, or there's a staffing challenge around a particular process, right? Well, then don't just change the process, but let's work with those that are, are, are in learning and development and HR to say, why can't we staff this properly? Maybe if we can fix the staffing problem, the current process is fine. Right? If it's not, how do we balance those two to collectively drive that improvement back to this culture of continuous improvement? It's not just about changing the process, not just about changing the technology. It's not just about changing the organizational chart, but it's a blend of people, process, technology, and the knowledge and information and experiences that enable them to get the work done. So the collaboration is so important and recognize we don't have to fix it ourselves. We've got a broad group of skills and talented people that we can work together with. And when we work together to a common solution, it has a greater chance of being correct, minimizing the cost and churn, and sustainable because we're all now bought into that solution together rather than us having to convince them after the fact that it's a good idea to do what we've now defined as an improvement. Um, assessments, process assessments are a nice tool um, whether it's a maturity model assessment or some other type of assessment to say, if we can understand our current state, what the future state is around some key characteristics and capabilities that will enable the outcomes we're after with improvement, now we have a way to measure how big our gap is from where we are and where we need to be, want to be, and then actually track our progress. So, so there's, a, there's a number of techniques for how you can leverage um, some of the models that APQC has around process management maturity or pro individual process maturity, or there's change management, supply chain, finance models out there. The key is leverage those tools to give you now a, a guidepost and a measurement stick to make sure that you are on the right track, you are making a difference, and you stay there once you get there. That's one of the things, sustain the change. We have to be able to make sure we stay there and use that as our next step to future improvement rather than reverting back and trying something different because we weren't on top of things. So um, I'm gonna jump into performance management, the next highest of the categories that we talked about before. Um, the top three challenges around data and measurement, that culture now, back to culture, of data-driven de decision-making. I've implicitly been talking about that on the prioritizing and selecting and working collectively towards common goals and outcomes on the previous section, right? But the culture that says, we use data now to inform those decisions. Maybe the data could be some of the assessment data from a maturity model. Maybe some of that data is your actual operational performance around that process itself. Maybe some of the data is the churn rate or the, the, um, the um, attrition rate of resources in that particular role that perform that work. There's so much data out there and you wanna make sure that you're leveraging the data that's at our fingertips and if it's not that we believe it's essential to making the right decisions, that we figure out how we can get that data, whether it's through some third party resource, an APQC member has data that's part of our benchmarking uh, on demand portal that you can leverage. There are many, many other sources of data, including internally. Um, and that's where, again, making sure we, we leverage the right data. And then the next step here, which is how do we ensure that what we are measuring and collecting is relevant? There's so much we can do, but what do we need to do? So if it's necessary for decision-making, that's the first most important reason to actually set up and collect the measures or the data. Now, decision-making at APQC will often talk about control points. If this is the work that we're performing, it could be the work could be selecting and prioritizing the next set of improvements, or it could be 
the how we actually manage our record to report and get our monthly reporting into a shorter cycle time for from a finance perspective. Whatever that work be is, our decision making can 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 then drive us into what do we need to measure? How can we control that? That tells us what are the measures and data that are necessary in order to actually take control, make make the managers or or individuals that are responsible to to control the work actually have what they need to do it with the confidence that they've got data insights into what's happening, what's coming, what we did in the past. And I can use that now to right size and direct the day to day, week to week, month to month actions for our, our work. So making sure that the measures we've got are relevant comes down to what do we need to control and are we actually measuring the right things? The second part of that is ensuring that those that are supposed to actually track and take control are then they understand the data and the measures and what actions they should take based on those. So they may not understand it. We may give them a dashboard, which is the third element on here. And they may say, but I, I, I look at it. It's interesting, but I don't know what to do if I see the needle going off track. Well, that's where we, if we've designed into the process and process support, this is the correct measure. Here's the controls that we think you can have within the operation or app, you know, execution of this work, this process. And now here's how you, as the manager, should be looking at the data and taking action. That doesn't mean they can't figure it out for themselves, but what we intend when we set up the measures, putting it into a very usable form and then ensuring they understand how to interpret it and use it is, again, uh, an area there. So when it comes to data and measurement, the th top three from the group are, again, culture and making sure under people understand we want to leverage the data appropriately to make our decisions. We want to make sure that what we are actually measuring and collecting makes sense for what we need to do, which is take control and manage the actual outcome. And then let's put that in a form and make sure the people that need to take action understand how to use the data and information that we presented to them. So I'm going to keep moving on here, uh, but hopefully this is giving you some thoughts and hopefully you can also align this to some of what you are doing, what you may be doing wonderfully and, and very successful and where there might be some opportunities to think about how you can improve your own approaches. So on data, again, I've talked about a lot of the potentials there, but focusing on what matters. Don't get lost in, in all of the data and what we can collect and what's available through the technology that's already out there. Data mining and process mining are very, very powerful techniques. But if you simply do it as a fishing expedition, searching for a problem, then you're unless you have the luxury of time to do so, um, you might be detracting from what is more critical for us to focus on. So starting with understanding how data and process fit together and how that aligns then to what we had can actually control. Very important to now prioritize and focus on data. And then again, aligning that data into usable forms. Some people are very data and they can look at a chart or a, or, or a set of data and they can discern a lot by looking at the data itself. Others need those visualizations. How does this data align to my process flow? And how does it? how is it influenced by different potential options or variations within what we do and how we perform the work? Or who might be doing that work itself? Or some of the different customer permutations in different market segments that might be there? So, so connecting now the data view to the process view is very empowering and often difficult. One of the key challenges we find there, though, is if you think about data architecture um, versus you know, the process view or process architecture, they're not one for one. The data for a process may not just exist for that process. That same data may support multiple processes. It may be created in one process or multiple processes, right? That data, it may be sourced from multiple processes. It may actually be consumed or used in multiple processes and not for the same purpose. So data and process have kind of an overlay that we need to understand. And data integrity and system of record and ensuring that you've got hopefully a single source of the truth when it comes to data, and then aligning that data, where you get it, how you get it, how you populate it, how you update it, um, how you can use it with confidence to where in the processes that data is created or, or consumed. That's really powerful. But again, it's now going beyond just process mapping, but it's now doing data process alignment with our processes. Um, and that now connects and enables both better data collection, data reuse um, with 
process performance. And again, ultimately it's connecting our actions to the outcomes that we need as a business. So focusing on what's important, prioritizing, and ensuring that it's to some viable business outcome, not just because we can do it, but because it su supports the needs of the organizational leaders, our external stakeholders, um, there's a good value proposition for what we're doing. Third area, now that we're going to jump into, is the evolution of process management and what it looks ahead. And in, the, in the, the survey data collection, we then asked a few very targeted questions about where do you see the future and what do you need for the future? Um, first of all, we talked about how effective do you view your process capabilities or your process program within your organization? Um, across that data set, 108 people responded to this question, and you'll see that um, over half of them said uh, it's an effective. Only 5% said very effective. Okay, we can kind of discern a little bit from that, but then we've got that other group here. Well, it's not really effective or, or ineffective. It's just kind of there, right? A quarter of people responded that it's kind of just there. 12% said it's just not working, and four said it's flat out broke, right? Now, back to what I said earlier, um, the audience that responded here, over 44% of the respondents had a role within process, within their organization. So these are actual process practitioners, people responsible for some aspect of, of, of either managing process, designing and improving process, driving continuous improvement. Um, about half of the respondents, that's their job. And they're viewing their job as a self-assessment of being very effective or effective right? Mostly effective. Um, the interesting thing, and I'm not trying to criticize or, or say that they're not reporting accurately, but what we find is when we go and talk to business leaders and organizational leaders and people in other parts of the organization, um, they often don't share the same view of effectiveness of what we're doing as a process specialist or practitioner. So while we're doing some things and we're making a difference, is it truly aligned communicated and and do they the this the critical stakeholders those that have to get the work done and actually you know result in the outcomes that the business is is there for um are they getting what they need so so we see that we're effective there's lots of tools techniques and approaches whether it's process frameworks and adopting and applying them and there's many benefits to those uh, it's continuous improvement activities. It's lean Six Sigma approaches where we can go in and actually work very effectively. And we see some huge, huge successes in, in some of our members and non-members alike in these areas. But it was more me trying to say as a caveat, let's not overvalue our impact until we understand, is it truly what the people in the organization need from us? That's a very healthy thing to do from time to time to say, what do they really need and are we delivering on that promise and that value that we can contribute there? Um, we've seen some fabulous work on, on leveraging bots and, and solving and saving huge amounts of labor through the application of at our fingertip simplified workflow tools and, and as I said, bots and other types of capabilities. That's great. In some of the organizations that we've been talking to about that, what they say is, that's a short-term solution. It's not our long-term solution, but it makes a difference and, and actually drives business outcome, the ease and effectiveness of everybody's workload day-to-day. -day. So it's a huge win, but we have more work to do to systematize and make that standardized into our bigger sets of technologies and improving our actual processes to adopt, adapt, and enable use of those tools more effectively. So we can be very effective. We can be effective, but it doesn't mean that we're done is the point. And we shouldn't look for how we can do more. Um, responsiveness to changing conditions. The audience here says, uh, you know, you can kind of look at that. Um, how responsive are we in the changes that are naturally occurring and sometimes accelerating inside of our organizations within the industries and market segments that we support? And about half of them are saying, yeah, we are effective in rolling with and adapting to the needs that, that are really coming from a, from a change in the environment, the ecosystem, the product service mix. I mean, think about what we've done over the last several years with a global pandemic and the huge adjustments every organization has had to make. So being able to adapt is really what this is. And, and, and the view is that we are. But again, there's still about a quarter of organizations that say we aren't. We aren't there yet. And then the, the rest there. So there's room collectively 
to enable, if we're doing well, hopefully enabling the rest of the audience to maybe get to that same point. When it comes to meeting the actual organization's needs, which ties back into what I was talking about a few moments ago, are we really doing what the business leaders, the organizational leaders, the executives, the, the individual workers, are what they really need that makes it, um, it enables their capabilities and their uh, and and helps them accelerates automates um, clarifies how they can get work done whether it's launching a new product whether it's uh, sunsetting an old product whether it's recycling um, old assets right whatever the job that that group or team or person is performing the work that they do are we meeting their needs and again in this case well it's not quite as good that implies that our alignment and collaboration with with the organizational leaders and and to what they really need and and how we can help them to move forward is not quite as strong as our ability to maybe adapt to change right um and you again i'm not going to go into all the numbers here but there's still a tremendous amount of room across this community to do more around better alignment whether it's continuous improvement, whether it's around supporting digital transformation, whether it's around getting control of end-to-end -end processes. So there, there's still more room for us to continue as a community to evolve. Now behind that, um, you know, changes in process management, what are the drivers of change? So we collected some information on that. Digital transformation, which I mentioned, over half said that is a huge driver. How do we apply evolving technology, whether it's uh, cloud-based technologies, whether it's, um, you know, chat GPT is something that's got a lot of press recently and many people have touched. And there's a lot about what the different technology companies are doing to support that AI, machine learning, cognitive types of, of technologies, right? But digital can also go further into the better application of, of sensing and control systems and decision support tools. And while they can be be also so you couple those I guess is what I'm saying to then the uh, the artificial intelligence and other types of uh, things there's so much capability and promise there but that's a huge amount of work that we need to now make sure fits into what our processes are how we've designed them how we've automated them how we have defined the roles and we train and support measuring and controlling and improving the work that people do um, that cycle time pressure and to reduce costs, it never goes away. It's always there. Um, and, and But it's still a, a third of people said that's a top driver for what we're dealing with today, right? In a downward economy, sometimes that becomes more visible. We have to be more efficient and productive with what we've got. So that, you know, sometimes that will drop a little when times are good. It becomes higher on the list of priorities as maybe it's a more challenging time for our organization. The pace of business change, it never seems to slow down. That's in there. Um, and then you can see focusing on customer and making sure we're not just designing what's good for us, but what delivers on that customer experience. And then the, you know, this unstructured work that we haven't really defined, and it's kind of the clutter around what we formally do. Um, how do we kind of get control of that and manage that in the change also? So half are there, and then you see that there's a big drop off to some of these other drivers, but they're still very relevant right? What do we need to change? How we work with information technology or operational technology, ITOT, right? The information technology being networks and infrastructure and the large systems and applications that support us, the operational technology, the control systems within our automation of a, a, a production line, that's, you know, or, or some other operational technology that we use in our day-to-day -day work, right? So there's a still a huge opportunity there to continue to evolve with those organizations because um, there's been a tremendous amount of progress over the last 5, 10, 20 years and beyond, but it's still not where we're all on the same playbook, working towards the same outcomes. We have to be able to divide and conquer some, but making sure that we're working towards collective outcomes and working better together when we can is definitely a huge opportunity in most organizations. Collaborative culture, back to the culture conversations earlier, very, very important uh, from the audience that we, we surveyed here. Making sure that we have more effective change management methodologies. It's great to go out and read a book, pick up, you know, Cotter or, or, or what ProSci has out there or other types of change methodologies. They're very, very powerful. 
but where and how do we apply them correctly? How do we make them right size? Using that term I had earlier, how do we right size the change approach to the problem that we're trying to solve and not just blindly follow the science or the recipe of change management, but say, let's collaborate and make change management a team sport and make it part of what we do at every step of the process. Because you start change the day you start talking about, are we going to do make an improvement, right? And as you talk with subject matter experts, stakeholders, the change management has already begun. But once we make the change and we launch it and deploy it to the organization, change management's not done. We have to make sure that we sustain the change over time, whether that's through retraining, it's through continuous kind of um, education and, and, and collaboration. Um, you know, change goes on. Um, and so that's the key. It's not a just happens at one spot, but if there's a continuum or a life cycle of change management that will help us to do better there. So leading into some of what we've seen, we've got research and where we um, have evidence of people being more effective by right-sizing change. Again, pick the favorite one. If you can get to a consistent one within your organization, that's fabulous, but now apply it correctly. We did some research on transformational change back seven, eight years ago, or maybe it was a little further back. And many of those organizations that were doing very well, that's what they said. We can't just follow a recipe for change management. We have to make sure that we think about it and apply it correctly to the problem, the size, magnitude, and scope of what we're doing. Process management, what we do, how we do it. There's lots of tools and techniques, but how do we, again, right size what we're doing there? And then ultimately ensuring that our people have the skill sets. We can't do all the process work for the entire organization, but we can ensure that we help them, guide them, maybe lead by example by stepping in and augmenting from time to time, but building up their competencies to do it in a more effective and way that will fit together collectively. So developing skill sets is very, very important, not just within the process workers with the formal role, but also with those that are actually touching, improving the processes over time. Staying relevant. So we wanted to know from a process management perspective, you know, is, is your role and the work that you're doing relevant? And what do you need to do from a skills perspective as a process management professional in some form? You might be a, an improvement specialist. You may be a process architect or, or a process owner. You may be actually helping to set up and manage a, a process uh, repository or tool set where process knowledge is captured and shared and reused. Whatever role you're in, these are the types of skills that the, the process workers are saying they need. At the very top, design thinking and change management. Back to change management we just talked about. We need to better understand how we can bring stronger change management at every step of the process from identifying, prioritizing, designing, improving, deploying, supporting the process-based changes that we're after. Design thinking also comes in. How do we think about this at, from a system or design perspective? How does the process and the technology and the organizational structures and the customer experience all fit together? Well, we have to do the design thinking techniques to not just solve the process problem, but solve the, the kind of performance and, and outcome problem that exists there. So design thinking techniques are so powerful to help us to look beyond just optimizing the process flow when that's not the real problem. We may want to tie together um, um, improving knowledge capture and transfer from you know, um, the, the uh, experts to the next experts or from the uh, novice to the journeyman to the you know, um, master craftsman, for instance. And so how do we design into our processes that ability to capture and apply and leverage the knowledge to grow our workforce. That's really powerful stuff that actually drives the ability to sustain the process beyond or the people changes that are naturally going to occur over time. So design thinking and change management are areas that people are focused on. And, and I've tried to illustrate what those might mean and how you can take a little bit more advantage of those for yourselves. Data visualization, that goes back to what we talked about earlier. How do we connect the data to our process visualization or our, our knowledge or our measurement visualization and ensure that they have continuity and it helps people to now take action. So when we can 
uh, create a dashboard. I mean, the dashboard on your automobile or on an aircraft or on some other vehicle, those the data visualization is in the gauges and the charts and the graphs that are presented. The fuel gauge, is it a numerical or is it a, 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 a you know, a, a semicircle with a line on there telling you where you are? How you now visualize the data and how that then ties into the actions and controls and use of that. Okay, I need to find a service station and fill up my car. Oh, you know what? Here's where we are on the um, the um, call wait times in our call center. And when we get below a certain threshold, it's time now to add additional staff or adjust the way that we're dealing with the lower priority elements. So there's techniques that we can manage from a control perspective. Um, there are techniques that we can actually institutionalize in our workflow to start with. Um, there's lots of ways to take the data visualization and either use it to drive Im improvement in the infrastructure or to actually manage day-to-day, hour-to-hour more effectively by, the, by the, the people and leaders doing the work. Data management itself, ensuring we've got control of the data, that single source of truth that I talked about before. How many of us have customer data that resides in five different systems with slightly different variations? How many of us have gotten to a true customer 360? Um, so that we are all working on the same information. Even though we may need to visualize it differently for different uses, it's still based on the same knowledge and information for that customer. Just one way and, of thinking about data, but it's long and, uh, and far beyond just customer data. How do we manage our data to ensure we can now manage it, ensure its integrity, and leverage it to its greatest impact? Whether it's into decision making, as I talked about before, whether it's into operational control, whether it's into identification of improvement opportunities, and there's many, many other uses for that data if we trust it and it's available when we need it. And problem solving, right? Problem solving. How do we think about problem solving skills, right? Because often um, the business may come to us and say, I need this new technology, but that may not be what they need. So we have to be able to think about problem solving. How do we get to what is the root cause and what are the alternatives that we have in order to solve the challenge? So what is your real problem? Is it, It's not that your technology is broken. It's that the technology and how you're using it today doesn't meet a business need. All right, great. So how do we solve that problem? And it may be that they need new technology. It's antiquated, it doesn't support the need, but don't just jump to the conclusion because someone asks for something. Fix my problem this way. So problem solving is a set of skills of how we think about and approach that. It might take weeks and months in some very complex instances, it may take minutes in other simpler circumstances to at least think a little bit more holistically, challenge different points of view, do some root cause analysis to understand what the real problem is and what the, the drivers of the problem are and then what are my alternatives to solve that problem? And we've seen that from time to time where someone says this process is broken. Well, the process is fine. It's what's producing the inputs to that process that are actually broken. And so you might have to look upstream. You might have to look downstream. You may have to look parallel to find out where you have opportunities to drive real impactful improvement. So um, what's next? Right? Where do we go from here? There's lots of information we collected. We do so much more research at APQC. I mentioned that the that uh, we went off and, and collected this information. There's a, a, a survey report that's on our website that you can go out and find um, that, that gets into more detail, talks about the demographics that I mentioned earlier. Um, but you know, so what is what it ultimately comes down to. We're using it as a platform to share some ideas and, and you can maybe align to the priorities that you've seen here and say, yeah, that fits us or ours are slightly different and, and that's okay, but but so what? Um, and that's where we wanna spend the last few minutes here and, and then get into Q&A. Um, so first thing that we take away was the top priorities haven't changed from 2022 to 2023. End-to-end -end work is still a very high priority for most organizations. Alignment to better value and resource management, structured and holistic improvement management, right? Collaborative and that culture of, those are all common themes. Doesn't mean there hasn't been progress, but it means we haven't gotten to the point where people feel that something else is now more important. Those are still areas to continue to grow, mature and evolve. Um, so, so that's consistency, but guess what? I've touched on this already. While we've been improving in these areas over the past year, what we can do and what enables us to make change has also been changing, that source of change and how we have to adapt, right? 
I, I mentioned some of the, the artificial intelligence and, and how people are really starting to leverage that and how, you know, um, certain organizations are now kind of going all in on developing it and now bringing that to the market in a more compelling and, and maybe breakthrough way. Well, guess what? How is that now going to impact how we do end-to-end -end work, how we align uh, value and resource management, right? How do we actually uh, identify and improve, uh, prioritize and then select and improve our maturity? Just an example. But the point being, while we're moving forward, things change with us. And so it doesn't mean that these go away, um, but we always have to go back to what I said earlier. If we are tackling these, is it because we're solving a problem or, a, or, or filling a need that the organization actually has and is important to the organization? That's ultimately what it comes down to. Back to then that alignment with the business, the organization, to ensure we're doing what helps them to achieve the outcomes that they control, own, and are looking to do more with. So um, the priorities are the same, but what they look like continues to change. The second element here then is that concept of staying relevant, right? And it, it gets, it, I've just been building on that a little bit, but we have to go beyond just working process and understand how process, performance management, measurement, benchmarking, uh, et cetera, change management, knowledge management, quality, um, there's so many different aspects to the work that we do. Risk management, compliance, you know, technology enablement and digital transformation. We have to make sure we are thinking about how the process work we do and the performance management work that we're, we're guiding is actually connected to all of those and is actually hopefully contributing towards moving the bar forward for everyone, right? Um, that's really, really powerful as we start to think about that. It means, though, that it's more work. We have to reach out and, and get the, the, the kind of attention of some of these other people that are thinking about these other dimensions and then try to find ways to work together with them and maybe do collective design thinking with them. Um, but ultimately saying, how can we work together to kind of force multiply our capacity to get to what really matters to the organization together rather than us each trying to fix it ourselves, right? So that collective collaborative approach, understanding and seeing, and then trying to drive the connection across all these different parts of the organization that are all looking to continue to move the bar forward. That's really, really powerful. And so we just need that perspective. So we don't get lost in the work we're doing um, and just try to fix process, optimize process, create great process documentation, automate business processes and workflows without thinking about what does it mean across these other dimensions. And then that sustaining of change, so, so powerful. I've said this again several times in the conversation, but we need to make sure that we're looking at how what we do from the beginning, middle, launch and deploy. Hey, here is the change. Here's the new technology. Here's the improved process. Here's the changed role definition with supporting training. How do we make sure that that is actually used by the business correctly we support and enable them to use it correctly. We learn from what they're doing and say, it's good enough, let's keep doing more of it, or it isn't good enough, let's now reassess and go back to what, what do we need to change, tweak and tune, or, or in a more significant way, redesign to now meet what the true business need is. So again, sustaining that change, enabling people to make the change, sustaining it over time, and learning from that to say, are we where we need to be or where we need to go? If you're lean Six Sigma folks, it's always been one of those things like in, is, is to always then say, let's take a step forward. Or if you're a fan of Agile, let's take a small piece of work. Let's go there, see where we are, decide what's next, and then take the next step, right? And at some point, you get to the point where, hey, we think we're done for now. Doesn't mean you don't stop looking for do we need to do more, but that's the point. So enable sustain, and then evaluate what, if any, is the next step there. So being better at collaboration across the different groups within our organization, and then enabling and sustaining change, that drives the relevancy of the process work we're doing, and how powerful and enabling it can be to that evolution or revolution in what we're doing and how we're delivering it to our stakeholders and our customers. So with all of that, I think we're we're kind of to the the end of the prepared prepared materials here. Um, there are a few links. Um, as you can go out and look at some of the the material on APQC. 
we've got a, an email here for, for Kelly if you'd like to contact her and get more information where you can share your story or, or perhaps uh, come back and talk to APQC, uh, myself, Maddie, and others. Um, but the point being, we are a community. We want to collaborate with you. We want to enable you, and we want to learn from you and help others learn from you also. So that's really what our mission is all about. And hopefully today has helped in some way towards where we are, where we've been, and where we're going. So now that gets us to Q&A, and we've got about, I think, what, eight or nine minutes remaining. Um, I'm going to pause and uh, maybe look at what's in the uh, the question and answer section. But Maddie or Kelly or anybody, if you guys see some items you think are priorities there, let's uh, kind of read them out and uh, take some action. Sure, thanks so much, Jeff. That was a great presentation. And yeah, we have a couple minutes to get to at least some of these questions, and we can cover the rest and follow up later on if we don't hit all of them. Um, I think the first one to start with might be, what standard do you recommend to assess process maturity? Okay, yeah, appreciate that one. And, and it's a good question. And, and for any types of, of assessments, there's many, many of them out there. APQC has, has two primary um, process maturity assessments. The process management assessment, which looks at the seven tenets of process management, how you collectively as a business unit or enterprise-wide manage your set of processes. So those seven tenants are what we've seen through our research from starting back in 2004, what's common about well-managed process organizations. So we have an assessment. There's several hundred assessable elements, maturity scale of one to five. And so we will start there typically at APQC. There's some research articles out on our knowledge base or resource library that describe it and talk about the different aspects there. We also have a process maturity model that looks at individual processes. It looks more deeply at how do you staff and how do you actually develop the next generation of workers so that that process can sustain and evolve and be improved over time. So the, the process management looks at your collective approach to prop managing your processes. Process maturity looks inside of a process to say how well are you doing to ensure that process has strength, evolution, and sustainable kind of uh, growth. Uh, so those are the two APQC in this area that exist. There's externals. You may have seen the PEMM. You may have seen the BPMM. Uh, if not, you type those into your favorite search engine and you'll see information on them. They're powerful and they can be used effectively also. So you don't have to use APQCs. Um, but again, thinking about what you're trying to assess and picking the best model is, is typically the first step. So we're happy to kind of talk that through with you to orient you but there are two available through APPC if you'd like to start there. Great, thank you. We've gotten a couple questions on RPA, so I thought I'd bump those to the top. First one was just asking if APQC has a benchmark um, on RPA adoption of BPM programs. And then we also have a question asking, how do you see the process automation trend in the industry and how might AI uh, be considered in the process management context? Ooh, those are some deep questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> Five minutes to answer. <laughs> we, have, we have done some, some targeted research on, on robotic process automation uh, in the past and we'll continue to do so going forward. So um, at the very minimum, you can go into our, our resource library on apqc.org and type in you know RPA, type in robotic process, uh, try a few different search terms there. Um, and, and you'll come up with what has been published. Um, ultimately, there's an evolution there, as I mentioned, um, but it's sometimes driven by the type of industry and, and your organizational culture. Where you are on that digital transformation that most organizations are doing in some form will dictate what you do with, with RPA. Um, you know, if you think about ro robotic process automation um, in a very holistic way, um, anytime we've, we've automated part of a production line, that's, that is RPA. But that's not typically what people are talking about. When we use workflow management tools, whether they're in SharePoint or whether they're in a more robust workflow management tool, we're doing RPA to a certain extent. We're letting the technology manage certain steps that could have been done by a person, but they're more consistent, faster, and produce maybe a, a better visibility and visualization on the progress that we're making there. So, so there's some of the simple things, like again, um, the, the simple workflow tools inside of, as I mentioned, SharePoint or Microsoft team, or if you're not a Microsoft shop, some of the other technologies out there, um, to more robust, how do we create bots 
and other types of technologies that can actually now take over a piece of work and enable people, whether it's around presenting information faster so they don't have to go search for it, or in some cases, those bots are actually performing steps that were manual previously. And those bots can be uh, in many different forms. I mean, we've always had the ability to go into a, a Microsoft Excel file and create macros. Well, that's automation when you think about it, right? Is it robotic process automation? You can decide whether it fits there. So I've kind of covered a kind of a spectrum here. The point being that when we really now get into what are the tools, the more targeted tools, um, some of the process mining tools, et cetera, how organizations use those, where they apply them is continuing to evolve. There's a tremendous amount of information out there, but at, to a certain extent, we have to be able to step back and say, what's our challenge? What's our need? And then what are the op the robotic process automation opportunities that are there and now say, does it make sense? Cost, effort, impact, does it actually move the needle forward organizationally? Um, and in some cases, it may be said, it, it, the, the return on investment takes too long, right? Okay, but at least you've done the analysis to, to get there. So, so at the highest level view, uh, it's very, very complex space. And how that then ties into AI, um, et cetera, um, again, we're seeing a lot of, of people playing in those spaces. Um, there's a lot of play out there and, and people talking about and postulating what might come uh, but I think it's a little too early to say here is some definitive examples and core, you know, um, benefits that we get from that more targeted set of of, of evolving technology enablement. So, um, you know, I can I can talk about specifics, but it would take a lot longer. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks, Jeff. Um, it's two fifty nine, so I think we're about at the end. Um, if you want to briefly, I know you touched on this in the presentation a little bit, so we might have time for it. Someone asked, are you seeing any big swings in survey results over the years? Um, which I know you briefly mentioned, but if you want to add anything else to that, that might be our last question. Yeah, I, I think that there's the, there are some of those subtle changes, like I mentioned, where based on economic conditions, uh, we may see some things become more and less relevant. Uh, but for the most part, it's it's pretty common. The same types of things are are in the top tier there. Um, what we find is the biggest challenge with process management is not learning and finding things to apply and make a difference, but it's back to that sustainment, right? How do we how do we up, learn it, apply it, and now make it a common, consistent way that we do things in the future? And we kind of do a little of this and then the organization kind of pivots and does a little of something else and it pivots again and it does a little bit uh, a third thing and then eventually it comes back and says oh, wait let's do what we did previously but we'll do it better now um so we see a lot of the target moves and we don't get this sustainable kind of evolution that is a true kind of every step forward is a step on a journey there so to speak so uh so that's really what i see as the biggest problem is this the the priorities don't change generally, but our ability to sustain progress so that what's pr a priority today maybe becomes less in the future, that's where I see less impact. Some organizations are doing really well there, but I see more organizations struggling to, to really build on the successes of the past and not let them fade away and always try something new. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I think we'll end it here and we'll try to address all of the other questions that were in the chat and the Q&A in our follow-up. Um, so just wanted to say thanks again to everybody for joining us today. If you're interested in any of our other future webinars at APQC, you can visit apqc.org forward slash events. And yeah, thanks again. Thank you, Jeff, for um, taking the time to present to us today. We appreciate everyone's support for being here and have a great rest of your day. It's been a pleasure.